Hello, welcome to the Friday, November 13th, 2020 edition of the Sands and Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich, and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. Over the last few years, you probably heard a lot about exposed Amazon S3 buckets. Well, uh, Amazon has taken some measures to make it a little bit more difficult to expose your data this way. But of course, other cloud providers have similar features. And Microsoft Azure calls this blob storage. Daniel has talked about this before and how it's as easy, maybe easier than with S3 to expose your blob storage. Well, as Daniel points out in a follow-up diary, this has changed now and Microsoft has added an option to simply disable public blob access. So if you're using this feature with Microsoft, take a look at uh, Daniel's uh, diary. He's also going over some of uh, the additional access control details and what kind of log messages to expect. Today, of course, was a big day for Apple with the release of macOS 11 Big Sur. But uh, with that update, we also got a couple of security fixes. First one for the brand new operating system. macOS Big Sur 11.0.1, that's the exact version that you should be running at this point, does fix a number of security vulnerabilities that apparently didn't sort of make it into the final 11.0 release. At the same time, we also got updates for macOS High Sierra and macOS Mojave. That's essentially the update that we had for Catalina, the most recent operating system about a week ago. A bit surprising is the size of uh, the macOS Big Sur 11.0.1 update. It fixes uh, about 55, if I counted correctly, uh, different uh, vulnerabilities. Bunch of open source components are being updated. That's sort of a little bit a typical thing for Apple, of course, in it, including a lot of open source components uh, with its operating system. But then remember, I already told you to be a little bit careful with an update to macOS 11 as it does have some significant changes uh, to its security infrastructure, which is actually a good thing overall from a security point of view, but uh, may cause some incompatibilities with older software. In particular, if you're using any software that uses kernel extensions, uh, you may have seen pop-ups as you are rebooting your system, warning you that uh, these kernel extensions are going to go away soon. Well, uh, check with your vendors, make sure they provided updated software. And well, DNS cache poisoning is back again. This is one of those attacks that uh, just keeps coming back and it's a little bit whack them all because Nobody really wants to implement DNSSEC, which would really fix it for good. The latest version of this attack uh, does uh, address a countermeasure that was introduced after Dan Kaminsky sort of came up uh, with his version of the DNS cache poisoning attack. What Dan Kaminsky abused or exploited was the fact that at the time DNS resolvers always sent the queries from a particular source port. Now, the fix here was to randomize the source port, making guessing it even more difficult. But researchers from the University of California, Riverside and Tsinghua University in Beijing figured out that uh, there is an easy port scan that one can do in order to figure out which ports the DNS resolver sent its requests from. So what you're doing is you're doing a simple UDP port scan. If a particular port was just used to send a DNS request, that port shows up as open. You will not get a response back. If a report is closed, meaning there is a UDP port unreachable coming back, well, uh, that means that port was not recently used to send 
uh, query. This, of course, depends on uh, the DNS resolver actually sending a UDP port and reachables back. And one thing they point out in their paper that in particular popular uh, gateways and gateways often provided by ISPs to uh, their users are sending UDP port and reachables back and are poisonable using uh, this technique. Again, the fix here is implement a DNS sec. Well, it's Friday again, and uh, with me today, I have another sans.edu student, uh, Rebel uh, Powell. Uh, Rebel, uh, could you introduce yourself, please? Yeah, sure thing. Like Johanna said, my name is Rebel Powell. I'm a candidate for a master's degree here at the Sans Technical Institute. I'm hoping to finish up late next month. I've been in information security for about 15 years now. I started in the military on a traditional offensive role and transitioned over to my current role here in the Department of Energy. I work for an agency that's called OSTI, who collects and disseminates the results of federally funded research projects to the American public. Okay, it's interesting. Uh, as a graduate student, I worked with Department of Energy on a couple of projects and really interesting stuff going on there. And I guess the decree will be your Christmas present, or <laughs> definitely <laughs> if, if it if it gets there. But uh, anyway, so you wrote a research paper about Exchange, Exchange Online, Office three sixty five, and such. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that paper? Sure. The paper's called The Poison Postman, Detecting Manipulation of Compliance Features in an Exchange Online Environment, which is a bunch of words to say that I took a look at the Microsoft Office Exchange Online 365 environment and looked at some features that adversaries could manipulate and take advantage of to exfiltrate data from our organizations. I think from the current space, you see a lot of the living off the land style attacks in the on-premise environments, and we've gotten quite a bit of defense and defensive strategies for it, but we're kind of lagging as defenders in the cloud, especially in the Office 365 space, given the current adoption rate, especially in times of COVID here. So I looked at two different features that were able to be manipulated and came up with some recommendations for folks to apply to their environment that would be low impact, but hopefully high value to their organizations. Here at the Internet Storm Center, we obviously see a ton of attacks that sort of try to fish uh, Outlook 365 credentials or, you know, OAuth uh, permissions and such. Uh, that has really become a huge problem. And yeah, as you say, there's a big rush kind of to uh, move uh, mail uh, off-premise into the cloud. Uh, what are sort of some of the things that an attacker could do that you're discussing in your paper? One that I found really particularly interesting is a lot of the research that you see, especially in the Exchange 365 environment, is the traditional, the attacker gets in by bypassing multi-factor authentication, and they just add Exchange forwarding rules where they're forwarding copies of the victim's email to themselves to exfiltrate data. But there's not a whole lot of research into some of the other features that are built in Office 365. And one of the things that I found that was particularly interesting in my research was just how wide that attack space might be. There, there's features all throughout the Office 365 environment that they're really good for defenders, but kind of a unified theme that I found as I was going through the research was that most of the adopters don't tend to know about them. And as is so often the case, the adversaries are usually the ones who are finding those features first and finding ways to abuse them before we as defenders catch up and find ways to protect them. So my research looked at two features that were in the Microsoft Office compliance feature section. So it looked at the traditional exchange in place hold, which is usually used for litigation. Most people are pretty familiar with that one. It's where you save emails locally to present to an investigator for litigation holds. And the second was the more modern version of that that Microsoft is pushing as a replacement for litigation hold, which is called the eDiscovery 2.0, which is really the same set of features, but at this time it's applied to the entire Office 365 tenant, so including OneDrive and some of the other pieces of Microsoft Office 365 in addition to Exchange. If you want to call it a traditional attack, is the attacker forwards these emails uh, to themselves. And of course, you know, there's plenty of guidance in how to monitor these forward rules and prevent them from being added and such. But uh, what you're basically saying is uh, the attacker here is sort of using 
a defensive feature against you. Instead of forwarding the emails uh, to themselves, which you may be monitoring, they could use these litigation hold features to retain copies of emails. And I believe they can also filter that for keywords or and then they basically can come back and download the emails at a later time. Is this sort of how an attack would work like this? That's correct. It's a really unique and interesting way because so much of our defense, especially in the cloud environment, is looking for that data going out. Whereas these features, they're built for litigation. So they're built to collect and store, like you said, keywords or particular topics of interest long term in your own tenant. And then basically the adversary comes back as they have time or as they have the need to. And then for just a few seconds, they're connected to download that file and they're gone again. Yeah, so how would they come back? Do they still need the original password to come back? So if the user would have changed their password, would this work? Or could this also happen via OAuth, which is sort of another uh, abused feature that we sometimes see? There, there's definitely the traditional, they keep your password and you haven't changed it. But there's also some of the newer features where they can do things like add accounts or even using third-party applications and granting pr- permission to the tenants. There was an attack that I saw during my research where they created a third-party application that connected to the Microsoft tenant, and it actually didn't show up in any of the traditional security interfaces. So the application maintained access to the tenant almost invisibly to the administrators unless you knew exactly where to hunt for it. Yeah, would you find this if you're sort of auditing uh, permissions that you hand out to applications? I know that some people now near restrict what applications may request access, and you need some kind of administrator approval uh, to actually permit a new uh, application. Would this work in this case? Definitely, but it was one of the things that I discovered was uh, as you look at who has the knowledge of the feature sets to do that, a good majority of the small and medium businesses that the paper were targeted on, their administrators really weren't dedicated to Office 365 administration as a full-time feature. They, They typically paid a professional services company to migrate them to the Exchange Online environment. And then they kind of turned over the environment to the administrators for care and feeding. So a lot of the challenge for us as defenders was really in the knowledge of where these features are and what they're doing. Add to your checklist, in addition to checking for forwarders, also check for these applications that uh, users may have added uh, or have been tricked into adding uh, to their account. Absolutely, as well as any of the use of these features for companies who don't have full-time compliance programs, especially the use of the litigation hold or the e-discovery features, it does produce very verbose logging capabilities that you can kind of discover what's being searched for and what's being hunted for. And the paper kind of talks about how to increase the verbosity and make it a little bit more human readable. But Accessing these features just in general creates log trails that if you know where to look for them, it's important to review, especially if your company is not using these features. Anybody using them becomes very interesting to you. Correct. Yeah. And uh, so at least you have some logs then to figure out what exactly was leaked, which can actually be a little bit tricky. I think sometimes if they leak it, we have the forwarding rules. Definitely. And even more interestingly was the log retention. That was one of the things that surprised me doing the research was that a lot of people have these really great exchange features enabled. But if you've not turned on some of the default retention rules in Microsoft, a lot of the logs are only retained for 30 days. So if you don't happen to catch that intrusion until 31 days later, you're really kind of left guessing as to what might be. Great work, and uh, a link to the paper will be in the show notes. What's your last class? What do you have to actually finish up in order to graduate by the end of the year? Well, I was in the GSE cohort that was, we finished the written exam, and we were getting ready to do the practical when COVID pushed us off. So we are doing the beta testing for the core competency exam that's going to be the exit course for us. So interesting. So, well, best of luck with that. Uh, Thanks for joining me here. And thanks for everybody for listening and talk to you again on Monday.